Thank you again for joining, and I will hand it over to NAMI's Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Ken Duckworth. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you, Katie, and thank you for all the work that you and your team do. Uh, we want to mention NAMI has a helpline. If uh, you get activated or distressed, uh, there are 150 volunteers at this phone number, at this email address uh, for you to contact. Uh, that has come up on occasion because uh, when you talk about complicated and difficult things, it can be provocative at times. Next slide, please. Uh, our guest today is an old friend of NAMI and the person I consider doing the best work on one of the most important topics in the entire field. And that's how to really work creatively building relationships with people who do not appreciate they are ill. Uh, my dad had bipolar disorder and I saw this all firsthand uh, that he would communicate with a microwave oven when he was psychotic and use it to heat up his coffee just six months later when he was better. And uh, this was the reason I became a psychiatrist. So I've been following Dr. Abador's work really my whole career. And I'm so grateful for what he has accomplished in terms of helping families really understand the problem and taking creative and relationship focuses approach. So he's a clinical psychologist and is the president of the LEAP Institute. He has many papers and accolades for uh, today. I'm just gonna say how grateful I am uh, for the work you do, Dr. Amador, and for donating your time to NAMI this afternoon. I'm gonna take your questions at the other end. Because we have close to 3000 people on this Zoom call, you won't be able, I won't be able to attend to your story in your family. Rather, I'll try to take big themes and get the good doctor to help us. And he will make it easy for you to work with him or find him at the end. And so thank you, Dr. Amador, take it away. Thank you, Ken, it's a pleasure to be here. And, and uh, I like your emphasis on an old friend because I've known Dr. Duckworth since uh, I think we worked together back in 2001. So it's a special pleasure to be here. And NAMI is my, my second family. I've been a NAMI member for about 35 years. So with that, I wanna tell you just briefly about LEAP Institute and how you can contact me when this is over. We provide education about anosognosia and then also about how to use our relationships to engage people in treatment who want no part of what we're offering them. And that's the program called LEAP, Listen, Empathize, Agree, Partner. Uh, it's an evidence-based program. I'm gonna be just describing it briefly towards the end of our time together. And we offer courses and trainer certifications. We train trainers as well. Leapinstitute.org. I'm gonna show you that uh, URL again at the end. Why am I doing that? Um, couple of reasons. You can contact me through the contact sheet there. I will get back to you. If we get way too many questions, we'll we'll do our best to figure out a way to, to respond to, to most, if not all questions. Uh, and there's other ways to, to uh, connect with me and meet with me and come and do a, a LEAP training uh, or, or organize one in your community. But let's start where I started. You know, uh, Dr. Duckworth was mentioning his dad. Well, I started this with my with my brother. This is a picture of my brother Henry and me. Henry's looking in the window of the car. I'm the little guy, you know, with his hands on the steering wheel. And uh, that picture of two brothers happy to be with each other kind of uh, is is really noteworthy because when that picture was taken, we had just immigrated from Cuba. We were refugees. Our father had been killed in the revolution. My mother was alone with four kids, me being the youngest, and she had her hands full. I mean, working full time, and, and it was just a very scary time for our family. My brother was a rock. I mean, he really, he listened to me. He taught me how to throw a baseball, how to ride a bicycle. He was much more than a brother. He was almost a father figure, but he was also a best friend. So fast forward in your mind's eye, in your imagination, 20 years after this picture was taken that you're looking at. And uh, Henry was living in Arizona with my mom and our stepfather. She remarried a wonderful guy who we called dad. And I was in New York. I was in college, a senior in college um, at one of the SUNY schools. And I get a phone call from Henry in Arizona, living with my mom and stepdad. And he's, I said, hello. And he said, come home quick. I killed dad. And he hung up. 
Now, I didn't for a moment think he'd actually hurt our father, uh, much less killed him. So I got him back on the phone. It took me a while to reach him. And what became immediately apparent as he was talking to me is that he was he was having a psychotic episode. He was hallucinating. Uh, he was delusional. He believed that he his playing the guitar had transmitted music into our stepfather's uh, brain while he was jogging, causing him to trip and fall. And that's how he died. So that's why he was saying he killed our father. He didn't. It was a delusion. Um, he was guilt ridden. He was suicidal uh, because of his guilt, um, all based on on delusions. He was hearing the voice of the devil. Anyway, I flew to Arizona. I flew home. And I'll never forget this, being in the living room with my siblings. Our blended family was huge. There's nine kids all together. And Henry's in his room. Uh, like I said, guilt-ridden, depressed. Um, and I'm in the living room with my seven siblings. And they all pointed at me one after the other and said, you go help Henry. You're the psychologist, <laughs> which was ridiculous. I was 21 years old. I was a senior in college. I wasn't a psychologist. I think the reason they drafted me, they selected me, was because of this picture, what it represents. We were very close to each other. Uh, and we really trusted each other. And this is a really important aspect of our relationship. There was a lot of trust. So I went and I talked to Henry and I said, look, you're hearing voices. You think you killed dad. Obviously you didn't kill dad. It's kind of a wild idea that guitar music, you know, he wanted no part. That's the first time anyone ever said to me, I'm not sick. I don't need help. And I bet a lot of you, if you have this circumstance in your homes, have heard the next thing he said to me. He said, you're the crazy one, not me. Uh, I had never used the word crazy, but but he uh, he felt that I was accusing him of that. It took me a week to get him in the hospital. I tried to convince him. I tried to educate him. Um, I asked him to do it as a personal favor. None of that worked. Like so many of us, I had to call a crisis team, a, a, the police actually back then. This is 1981. The officers were fantastic. I met him out front. I explained my brother wasn't well. He wasn't violent, anything like that. He goes to the hospital. He gets an antipsychotic medication. And I, I, I was just shocked as to how well he did. He really responded well to it. The hallucinations disappeared. The delusions disappeared almost entirely. And after a month, this is back in the 80s, we had a month-long hospitalization, very stable, doing well. We're at a meeting with his psychiatrist and his social worker. And Henry's told he has schizophrenia and the medication he's taking, he have to stay on it for the rest of his life. He said he understood and he agreed. We got home. Mom made dinner. Henry goes back to his room afterwards. I'm doing the dishes and I go to throw something in the trash bin under the kitchen sink. And what do you think I found? I bet you know. <laughs> I found that bottle of medication that I thought was a lifesaver. So I fished it out of the garbage and I was pretty frustrated, I'll be honest. And I knocked on his door and I brandished the bottle. I said, what's going on? You said you knew that you needed to take this. And he said, well, that was then, you know, it, it's better now. I was like, Henry, that was four hours ago. Come on. That started a seven year period where our relationship looked like this picture. Henry running away from me, running away from, from doctors like Dr. Kenworth and others who wanted to help him. Um, and it, it also his, his life went to hell in a handbasket. He was hospitalized oftentimes uh, up to four times a year, mostly involuntarily. He wasn't able to work. He didn't go to college anymore. He dropped out, lost his friends, lost his girlfriend, was homeless for a while. And we're talking close to 30 hospitalizations over seven, seven year period. He was really, really ill. No amount of trying to argue with him or convince him, uh, convinced him that he had a, a serious mental health condition and needed treatment. So I was becoming a psychologist during those seven years. And I was on my internship year. I was working on an inpatient unit. And I had this patient, this woman, just like my brother. She said, I'm not sick. Nothing's wrong with me. Leave me alone. My mother should never have called the crisis team on me. I don't belong here. And I was kind of debating with her and trying to quote, educate her about her problem. And I went and talked to my supervisor because I was frustrated. And she reminded me so much of my brother. And I, I'm telling him the same story I'm telling all of you. And, and my supervisor, I never forget, really wise guy, wise, not a wise guy, um, put his hand up and said, Javier, stop talking. So I, I stopped talking. He says, no, you don't understand. Stop talking to her. 
Start listening to her. Ask her what she wants. Ask her what she thinks her problem is or problems. So I went back out and I met with her. And I apologize. I said, I wasn't really listening to you. I was telling you what you needed to do and that you should take medicine. Let's start over, please. What do you want? And she said, I want to get the heck out of the hospital. Actually, she used a more colorful word than heck. But she wanted to get out of the hospital. Big surprise. And she said, I want my mother to stop calling the police and the crisis teams. I said, you know, I can work with you on those two things. That afternoon, she accepted medication because I told her that was a way we could get her out of the hospital. Uh, within a week, maybe two weeks later, she agreed to meet with her mother and me in the clinic that I was working in as, as an intern. So that really, you know, it was a, an epiphany for me in terms of my relationship with my brother. And I called him up and I, and I said a couple of things. I apologized for all the times I told him he was mentally ill. And I said, Henry, I promise I'll never do that again. I kept that promise. Then I apologized for all the times I told him he needed to take medication. And then I promised I will never again tell you you need psychiatric medication. I kept that promise. Within six months of that shift in me, not in him, the shift in me, he started to change and he accepted a long acting injectable medication. He stayed on for the rest of his life, nearly 20 years. My brother died um, literally being a good Samaritan, uh, was, was tragically hit uh, by a car in a car accident. But I'll tell you those 20 years after the shift in how I was talking with him and the shift in our relationship, um, uh, he stayed in treatment. Uh, our relationship improved. This is a picture of Henry and me. Um, uh, I think a picture is worth a thousand words, the way we're smiling at each other, the way we're holding each other. I'm the one on the left with the, the Jerry Seinfeld haircut. Um, and Henry was always taller. He was still my big brother. Um, he not only got his little brother back, but he got two part uh, two part time volunteer jobs. He had a girlfriend when he passed away. Uh, he went to a clubhouse to go spend time with, as he put it, those mentally ill people. They're really nice. He never believed this is real important. He never believed he had schizophrenia. When I asked him, well, if you don't have mental illness, why are you taking these shots every month and the medication? He took some oral meds too, and his answer was very telling, and it's going to relate to the research I'm going to share with you right now and 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 my dis description of the LEAP program. His answer as to why he was taking medication, even though he knew from his perspective he wasn't sick, was he said, I do it for you. And he named two other people that, that ran the uh, supported living uh, arrangement that he lived in, the halfway house he lived in. So what was my brother's answer? Stayed in treatment for almost 20 years. And did other things, you know, engaged with a clubhouse and, and work. He, he stayed in treatment for relationships, not because he had any insight. And I'm going to tell you a little, about a little research that shows that my brother is not that unique. Before I do, let's talk for a moment about the media and how it covers stories of people like my brother. Um, it's, it seems like we mostly hear only when crimes have been committed. Here's one of those stories. This is a picture of Margaret Mary Ray. And um, I'm going to guess most of you don't know who that who that was. Uh, many of you will remember her as David Letterman's stalker. That's what the newspapers called her. Um, she had the delusion she was married to the celebrity late night TV host. She was certain it was a delusion. She had schizoaffective disorder. He would come home from the studio in New York City to his his mansion in Greenwich, Connecticut, and she'd be in the house. She'd break in and she'd. She'd be like, well, hi, honey, how was work? And he'd go and call 911 and have her arrested. So Margaret Mary spent a lot of time under arrest, in courtrooms, on probation, at even short stints in jail, and um, never got treatment, never understood that she wasn't married to the man she delusionally believed she was married to. And why I'm telling that story is going to, be a little bit clearer to you in, in about 15 minutes. But I have a question for everybody, and, and Katie is going to put up a poll um, to see what your answers are. Would you agree with this statement generally? Denial of illness impairs your, your common sense judgment about the need for treatment and services. Would you agree with that? Yes or no? Let's see what, what you all think. 
Does denial impair your common sense judgment about whether you should be in treatment or not? Okay, 95% of you said, uh, yeah, it impairs your common sense judgment. Only 5% of you agree with me. I don't think it does impair your common sense judgment in this way. Bear with me. If I take the perspective of my brother Henry or Margaret Mary Ray, who I just told you about, or the millions of Americans with serious mental illnesses, so schizophrenia, and a lot of mental illnesses are serious, so I'm, I'm using that term shorthand today to talk about people with schizophrenia, schizoaffective, delusional disorder, bipolar dis disorder. Those are the main disorders that I'll be, I'll be summarizing under the serious mental illness. If I take the perspective of Henry, Margaret Mary Ray, and millions of Americans with serious mental illness, it's who don't believe they're ill. It's common sense to refuse treatment. It makes no sense to accept treatment if you don't believe you're ill. This is not a poll, but I have another question for you. I want you to think about it. Would you inject yourself with insulin knowing you don't have diabetes? You're certain you don't have diabetes. Would you inject yourself with insulin? I don't need a poll to know the answer. No one's going to do that, right? That's the perspective. That's what it's like to not understand you're mentally ill and 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 be offered treatment. It, it doesn't make sense. It, would, it could hurt you, a lot of people tell me. Um, but are we dealing with denial? In most cases, what the research is showing uh, is that we're dealing with a neurocognitive symptom called anosognosia. Um, let me tell you about the history of this term. It's a tongue twister. Anosognosia is a lot of syllables. But it was this, this syndrome and this term was coined by the neurologist Babinski in France. He's the same Babinski that, that discovered the Babinski reflex in, in infants. With anosognosia, what he described were people, for example, with brain damage. So we're not talking about mental illness. We're talking about neurological disorders. People with brain damage who, for example, had hemiparesis paralyzed on one side of their body and didn't know it. I've actually evaluated these. I worked at a neurology service for a year. Uh, I evaluated people with this, this symptom. And it's really remarkable. How can you not know you're paralyzed? Uh, there's one man in particular I asked, can you move your arm? I, I was assessing anosognosia and he was paralyzed. He said, oh yeah, I can move my arm. And he, he I asked him to move it. It didn't move. And instead of learning that he had paralysis, he accused me of injecting him something th uh, in the IV to paralyze his arm. So he didn't understand. I'm going to talk just a little bit more about, about this syndrome in neurological uh, patients. Before I do, if you want to learn how to say this term, and I think it's really useful to learn how to talk about it, um, this is the trick I use. Uh, a woman know, a woman known, a woman named, sorry, uh, Anne is very nosy. So Anne knows egg nosia, anosognosia. And uh, if you're comfortable, I'd, I'd, I suggest, I'd invite you to say it out loud right now, anosognosia. Uh, if you practice it, it's not that hard to, to say, actually. But let me tell you about one more person uh, with uh, brain lesions, brain damage. This is somebody who was part of a study that I did with my colleagues at Hillside Hospital in Queens. You can see the reference down below if you want to look up the article. And we were evaluating people with um, brain damage from stroke, from cancer, from closed head injuries in the frontal lobes of the brain to see if you see anosognosia there. Because the classic descriptions of anosognosia are that and Babinski's early descriptions was in different parts of the brain, not the frontal lobes. So here's a common task in a neuropsychological test battery. I asked this gentleman who I'm going to share his, his picture in a moment, can you draw this clock? On a scale of one to seven, seven is a perfect copy. One is a terrible copy, right? Three is okay. What do you think? How do you think you'll do? I think if I asked you that question, most of us would say a six or a seven. We could draw the clock, indicate the correct time. He said, seven, I'll have no problem drawing this clock. Remember, he had frontal lobe damage. Did he have a problem? Clearly. Did he see he had a problem? Not at all. Uh, so I started pointing to the 12s. I pointed to the 12 into the, in the rough circle, and I asked him, what number is that? He said, 12. Then I started pointing to those four other 12s outside. And as I kept pointing to them, 
He got flustered, angry. He pushed the paper away that had the drawing on it and said, you switched my drawing. So even though he had irrefutable evidence that he had a, a problem doing this, he didn't learn you know, by that evidence. And when I started showing him that he did do, you know, an unfortunate, you know, poor copy of the clock uh, by showing him all the 12s, he didn't say, oh, I see what you, I see what you mean. I've got a problem. Instead, he got paranoid. He had what's called a confabulation. What are confabulations? Basically, our brain is making up stories to fill in gaps in our memory or in his case, in his perceptions. So internally, he knew he could do this, but, but, uh, he obviously couldn't, and and instead of learning, became paranoid and, and confabulated. So, you know, when I started my my research career at Columbia University on the Schizophrenia Research Center uh, back in 1989, I was real interested in this in this issue, this problem I'd encountered with my brother and so many patients I worked with during my training, and I, uh, with my colleagues, did a big review of the research literature, and then we made a proposal. To the field, we say we we need to study this problem, and you know we think it may be associated with frontal lobe dysfunction. That it's not denial, it's not a result of you know fear of stigma. It's a frontal lobe deficit. Right away, people went out to test our hypothesis. This is a partial list. If I updated this list, this goes to two thousand four. If I updated the last twenty years, we'd have six more slides. What are these studies finding? moderate to strong correlations between executive dysfunction, which is frontal lobe dysfunction, and poor insight, people not understanding they had schizophrenia. These are all studies done on people with schizophrenia. So what's the headline here? The way the brain is functioning in persons like my brother or Margaret Mary Ray, who I told you about, uh, who don't understand they have mental illness, we tend to see what's called hypofrontality. Uh, a lower level of functioning, if you will. It's a little bit of a crude way of, of describing it in, in the frontal lobes of the brain. Well, that's how the brain's functioning, how it's working. What about the way it looks? Here's evidence from 20 studies looking, post-mortem studies and brain imaging studies, at the brains of people with schizophrenia who had awareness, had insight, compared to those who did not have insight. All of these studies found significant differences between the subjects who knew they had schizophrenia compared to those who did not know they had it. And it was in one, one or more brain structures, and all of them lay primarily in the prefrontal and frontal cortex of the brain. So here's very compelling evidence between the neuropsychological studies I showed you a moment ago, and now these studies looking at brain anatomy that the brain even looks different. Some of the findings, for example, were reduced gray matter. For those of you who know, uh, uh, you know brain anatomy, it's the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So the frontal cortex of the brain was actually showing less gray matter in those subjects who did not understand they had schizophrenia. So the headline is frontal lobes clearly uh, look different uh, and, and function differently in people who do not understand they have mental illness. Three of these studies included people who had never been in treatment. So there's two headlines here. One is that the, the brain differences that were found were not a result of, of the medications causing brain differences. That's not what was going on. But the other interesting thing is, and, and we have lots of other research that indicates this, is that first episode, people with first episodes of schizophrenia, you know, 18, 17 years old, 21, 25 years old, had these brain differences, those who did not understand they were ill had different frontal lobes. So we, back in 2000, I was one of the, one of the um, co-chairs of the revision of the DSM. The DSM, for those of you who don't know, is the authoritative diagnostic manual that all mental health professionals use, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, nurses, et cetera. And back in 2000, uh, we wrote about anisognosia, but what about the most recent DSM, uh, the one that was published just two years ago? Uh, I was asked to submit text and it was vetted and peer reviewed by the work group who was revising the, the DSM, psychotic disorders and schizophrenia section. So what is, this is verbatim, what's in our 
authoritative diagnostic manual, unawareness of illness is typically a symptom. It's not a coping strategy. It's not denial. It is comparable to what we see in neurological deficits following brain damage termed anisognosia. So this is, even though you may, you were very likely encountering a lot of clinicians who don't know about anisognosia, you know, tell them to have a look at their DSM uh, because it's been in, in that manual for 24 years now. And this is the most recent one from 2022. What else did the, the work group uh, put in the DSM? This symptom, it's a symptom. It's not denial. This symptom is the most common predictor of non-adherence to treatment. So non-adherence is a term of art. It, it basically means people who will refuse treatment or like my brother, accept it, but then drop out, typically without telling anyone. So this is the biggest predictor of, of those problems. It predicts all kinds of other negative outcomes like higher relapse rates, more involuntary treatments, poor psychosocial functioning. So quality of, of relationships, ability to work, uh, ability to uh, pursue education, uh, all kinds of things have been looked at. Family relationships deteriorate also in persons with anisognosia. Uh, the research also found that aggression, that's not violence, it's not physical violence, but it makes sense. If everybody around me is telling me, you know, Javier, you've got bipolar disorder, you got schizophrenia, and I don't believe I have it, I'm going to start to get angry. I'm going to start to, you know, get, pardon the expression, but pissed off at people. So that's the kind of aggression that the studies are finding. And anisognosia also predicts a poor course of illness. So if you're talking with a healthcare professional who doesn't know, you have a loved one, let's say, with anisognosia, you believe they do, um, point them to page 101 in the manual. I guarantee you they have on their bookshelf the DSM-5-TR. So let's talk just a moment about antipsychotic medications. What do you think the problem is with oral antipsychotic medications, pills and capsules? The problem is, what the research shows, is that people either refuse or stop taking them without telling anyone, just like my brother, my finding the bottle of pills in the garbage can, right? Here's one study. This is, a, this is representative of many dozens of study that find very similar rates. Uh, the Rumel and Kluge study found that between half to three quarters of people with schizophrenia don't take the medication that they're prescribed, or they only take a little bit of it, subtherapeutic doses. This is a longitudinal study done by uh, Sam Keith and John Kane, who's the, the chair at Hillside Hospital in Queens, New York. They followed people over a two-year period, and they found that within seven to 10 days of writing a prescription for an antipsychotic medication, 25% of their patients were off the medicine. They stopped with just within a week and a half. 50%, half were off after a year, and 75%, three quarters of, of the people in this study were off the medication after two years. This study, both of these studies, have been replicated numerous times. And why is that important? It means, from my perspective and, and other scientists like myself, clinicians and scientists, you can take it to the bank. This is, this is you know, a clear, reliable scientific finding. It's a big problem, non-adherence to treatment. So what can we do when we're successful in offering treatment? And I'm gonna talk about that, you know, how, to, how to help someone accept treatment. What should we be offering? Uh, Long-acting treatments given by, by injection, long-acting injectables. In this study, half, like most studies find, on the oral medications, on the pills and capsules, stopped taking medication compared to only 17% on the long-acting injectable medications, right? So let's flip those numbers around. 83% on the long-acting injectables stayed in treatment, only half on the oral medications. So how do I understand that? If I have anisognosia for my mental illness, and I've got to every day, once, twice, three times a day even, put a pill in my mouth and fight my resistance, you know, fight my certainty. I'm not sick. I don't need this medication. I'm going to eventually throw the pill away like my brother did because, you know, my, my common sense is going to win out. My common sense tells me I don't need treatment. 
because nothing's wrong with me. Long acting treatments given by injection once a month. There's even some that you get only once every three months. So only 12 times a year or only four times a year do I have to overcome my resistance if I have anosognosia. The other thing is it's a very social administration of medication. You're not alone in the bathroom taking a pill. You go to a clinic, you, you meet the receptionist, hopefully they're friendly with you and you meet the, the nurse or the, the PA who's gonna give you the injection. Also intuitively, it's a smoke detector. If somebody misses an injection appointment, uh, you can talk with them and see if you can help them to make a new appointment. And I'm gonna tell you about some videos that are free um, that, that you can access. And one of them is exactly about this scenario. A young man with, with schizoaffective disorder misses his uh, appointment for an injection and his doctor calls him and they have a conversation using the LEAP approach, which I'll be introducing you to. The other thing is it reduces tension. Um, as a family member or as a clinician, you know, we often are in the position of having to ask, well, are you taking the medication? And I don't have to ask that question anymore and, and put my patients, or in the case of my brother, in the uncomfortable position of not wanting to tell me that they've stopped. So yeah, I just know one way or the other if they're in treatment. So it reduces tension. And then the third kind of intuitive benefit to this kind of treatment is it, you can use relationship. You can use techniques like the LEAP approach to help somebody change their mind and, and make a new appointment. And again, there's a video that you'll be able to see that, uh, that, that shows that scenario if you're interested. So let's summarize. What do we know about awareness of having an illness and treatment adherence, right? Acceptance of treatment, staying in treatment. Well, awareness of being ill is the top predictor. It's among the top two predictors of who will stay in treatment long-term like my brother did for, for nearly 20 years. What do you think the other top predictor is? Katie has one more poll for you. You're going to have three choices, three options to choose from. And uh, just take a moment. What do you think the other predictor is? And this is in patients with anosognosia who do not understand they're ill. What's going to predict they're accepting treatment and staying in treatment long term? Just like Henry did. And there's a hint in that, in that, that comment, by the way, because of what Henry said. Side effects. Past experience with medication, supportive relationships. So side effects, about 12% of you. You know, when I looked at the research, I thought that it was going to be side effects. It turns out side effects don't predict who will uh, refuse treatment. I have borderline high blood pressure. First medication I got from my doctor gave made me dizzy, gave me what's called orthostatic hypotension. I didn't throw away the blood pressure medication and, and refuse all treatment. I went back to my doctor and said, hey, can we try something else? So it's not side effects. Um, or past experience with medications. It is a kind of relationship, but not just a general supportive relationship. It's a relationship. And this next part I'm going to show you is a summary of research on therapeutic alliance. Someone listens to you without judgment. So when I say to somebody, let's say I've got schizophrenia, I'm not ill, I don't have schizophrenia, the person that's talking to me is actively listening and saying, so what you're telling me is you don't have schizophrenia and you don't need this medicine. Is that right? Did I understand you? So it's a respectful, non-judgmental communication. Uh, and I'm going to give you a little bit more examples of that in a minute. Uh, so respectful, non-judgmental, and they'd like to see you in treatment. Those are the three characteristics of a relationship that leads to treatment engagement. Uh, staying in treatment as well. So to summarize everything I've been through here so far, I've been talking about, what do we know about anosognosia for mental illness and acceptance of treatment? We never win on the strength of our argument of providing evidence. You've got a problem. You've got mental health condition. You, it doesn't work if the person has anosognosia. We win on the strength of our relationship. Respectful, non-judgmental communication. So summary of what I reviewed, the research. Anosognosia, often called poor insight, into having a serious mental illness is a neurocognitive symptom. It's not denial. It tends to be stable over time. I didn't mention that research in the interest of time, but we have looked at, our field has looked at the research, uh, two year periods even. And in most people, like my brother, when successfully treated, it turns out the anosognosia doesn't usually doesn't improve. 
So we really have to come up with a different way to engage people in treatment. It's not like let's get them in the hospital and treat it and fantastic. They're going to have insight and stay in treatment. That's not the typical story. It's, it's the typical story is the one I told you uh, about my brother. He never understood he had schizophrenia, yet he stayed in treatment for a long time. It is the top predictor. Anesognosia is the top predictor of treatment refusals and dropouts, predicts higher number of hospitalizations, poor psychosocial functioning, and lots of other negative outcomes. And it's just a barrier to creating a partnership, a working alliance with the person. So when you're, you're talking about anisognosia, just one more comment about this. How we talk about it really matters because it impacts how you're going to behave, how you're going to communicate, and what you're communicating to the, the rest of the family. Um, so try not to say things like, she does not accept she has an illness. Because that, you know, that indicates that we think the person has a choice. And they're just not accepting it. Or he refuses to acknowledge he has mental illness. Um, would you ever would you ever say this about somebody that they refuse to stop hallucinating? Would you do that? No. And why not? Because you know it's a symptom. It's not under their control. Well, so is this lack of insight, this anisognosia. Nobody's refusing anything. They just can't understand. Uh, deny as she has an illness. Doesn't admit as if the person really knows, but they're being stubborn and they're not going to admit it. Won't admit. Refuses to admit that they have mental illness. I would, if you if you come away from today, um, convinced that this is a real symptom, this anisognosia, this unawareness. I encourage you not to use this kind of language. What kind of language can you use? Things like she cannot comprehend. Not because of intelligence, but because of this neurocognitive symptom of anisognosia. Can't comprehend she has an illness. He's unaware he has mental illness. Unable to see or understand that, that she has mental illness. And ideally, and I'm starting to see this in medical records, thankfully, because there's so much research indicating this is a real symptom, uh, has anisognosia for mental illness. That's ideally what, what we'd be saying, right? Can't comprehend, is unaware, unable to see, has anisognosia for mental illness, rather than things like refuses to acknowledge. So, boy, I've covered a lot pretty quickly. <laughs> um, about anisognosia for mental illness, but what does it feel like? Um, Katie and, and Nami has given me the opportunity to, to do a role play with you, not with all of you, obviously. We're gonna need a volunteer. This is real important. Please pay close attention. If you've seen me do this role play, uh, where I'm gonna talk to you about your, your spouse, uh, please don't volunteer. That's real important. So to volunteer, you gotta have a webcam that you're you're willing to turn on. Remember, this is being recorded, so you, hopefully you'll be comfortable with that. And uh, you are married, currently married, and you are currently working. That's really important for this role play to work. Okay? Get a webcam. You'll, you're willing to turn it on, and you're married, and you're working. Go to the reactions button at the bottom of your screen and press that little yellow hand. And Katie is literally randomly going to pick someone. And you and I are going to talk together for a few minutes. Katie, you're still with me, right? I am. I'm working on promoting someone. Just one minute. Okay, so I didn't mean to rush you. Sorry. Bernadette. I think we've got a volunteer. And if you could unmute yourself and turn your video on. Oh, we've got two volunteers, Kimberly or Bernadette. Ah, it's Bernadette. <laughs> How you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Hi. Nice to meet you. And thank you for volunteering. I really oh, appreciate it. My pleasure. Um, Bernadette, what's the name of your spouse? First name? Jim. James. Well, I call him Jim. Okay, Jim. And uh, your supervisor at work, what's, what's their first name? I forgot. Kirsten. Kirsten, that's right. Um, this is awkward, Bernadette. 
Um, and this is not the leap approach I'm going to be introducing. Uh, but I was asked by, by Jim and his wife, who's not you, his wife, Susan, uh, to, to try and help you today, to kind of do an intervention. Your, your supervisor, Kirsten, also asked me to tell you that she's putting you on a six-month six leave of absence. And the reason for that is not only are you not married to Jim, I know you think you are. How long do you think you've been married to Jim? Too long. <laughs> Too long? 20, 20 yeah, years? 20, 20, 22 years. That's what I heard from him. And do you believe you have kids together? I forget. No. No. Okay. I wasn't, I wasn't clear. Anyway, look, they contacted me before this seminar. And, and like I said, Katie was good. Katie was hoping you were going to volunteer so that we could pick you. Um, I have restraining orders that I can email to you showing that, you know, you clearly are uh, stalking just like Margaret Mary Ray did with David Letterman. You're stalking this poor man, Jim and his wife, Susan. Uh, and it's a, you know, stay away restraining order. Um, if I showed you those, would that convince you that you're not married to Jim? I don't think so, right? No. All okay. right. Well, the good news, you're at work right now, right? Right. Yeah. Well, Kirsten told me to let you know that right now you're on a medical leave of absence until she gets a report from a treating psychiatrist that you've been in treatment and that you're no longer going to harass Jim and his family. So I'm going to ask you to, to get up and go and speak with we've got a mobile crisis team a mental health crisis team out in the, in the outside the front door of the offices and they're willing to talk with you you're not a danger to yourself or others as far as we know you're okay with that but they'd like to talk with you and, and maybe offer to to help you would you be willing to get up and go outside and talk with them i probably would because i'm afraid of losing my income yeah well you're gonna have to leave so Let's imagine you go out there and, and you're talking to them and they say, Ms. Moore, um, you know, we'd really like to offer you a hospitalization or at least an evaluation in an emergency room. Would you be willing to come with us? We think you might, you know, have a, a problem here with this belief you're married to this man, Jim. Would you go to the hospital and get evaluated? I guess to prove that I'm not ill. Okay, so they take you to the hospital, you're in the ER, the doctor evaluates you, and she says, well, you know, I think you'd really benefit from an admission to our unit, our psychiatric unit upstairs, our behavioral health unit. Would, would you be willing to go? Now, I can't hold you. Yeah. Okay, so you're going to leave. Pardon me? You're going to leave against medical advice, right? You, you're not going to go upstairs. No, I that's don't okay. want to be hospitalized. Okay, so that's your... Your, the doctor says to you, ma'am, that's your choice. We wish you the best. I wish you'd change your mind. If you do, come back and talk to us. You go out into the lobby of the hospital. Where do you go? What do you do? Who do you call? Well, I would hope that they would direct me to somebody that I could go to out of patient. Okay. But where so, do you go to while you're, while you're waiting for that appointment? Oh, where do you, where I see do you what go? you're saying. Because now I don't have a place to live. Is that what you're saying? You're not going to test that out. I'm sorry. All you have, all you have is me in this meeting telling you you're delusional, and you've got a doctor and an ER and a crisis team telling you you're delusional. Do you think you're delusional? Do you remember getting married to Jim? You remember your wedding day? Yeah. Yeah. Do you really think you could be convinced that quickly that it didn't happen? No. Okay. So you're outside the hospital. Do you go home or do you call Jim? I would go home. Okay. So when you go you. home. Okay. So you go home. We're Jim. Uh -huh. Your key doesn't work. Guess what happens? You get arrested. Okay. You're brought before a judge. Now I'm the judge. Ma'am, we've got a mental health diversion court. I've got two charges, criminal trespassing and violation of a restraining order. Now I'm going to give you a choice. We can go to trial on those two charges. Or we have a, a pre-trial mental health diversion program. And you can go with our social worker, court personnel in the back of the of the courtroom here and go to an emergency, uh, go to a hospital and get evaluated. What would you like to do? I'm the judge. I'm, I'm giving you a choice. Go to trial or go to treatment. What do you want to do? I guess I'd go to treatment. 
great. I wish you the best, ma'am. I'm looking for a report from your treating psychiatrist in 30 days, another one in six months, and we can expunge these charges, dismiss the case. I wish you the best of luck. That's what the judge says. So you go to the emergency room, and the same thing happens. You see, see the same doctor. And she says, would you like to get admitted to the psych unit? Well, it's your choice. You're not a danger to anyone. It's your choice. Well, is it court ordered? Because no, ma'am. It's no? your choice. No. Wow. We, we can't force you. No. The, do, the the judge is giving you a choice. Go go into the criminal justice system, go to trial, or go get some help. And now they're offering you the help. What do you say? You want to get admitted to the unit? Well, there's a lot of diff factors here. Mm -hmm. Because in my mind, I still live home with Jim. That's right. And, and you're you're saying my delusion or I don't live with Jim. Bernadette. So Bernadette, it's not just, it's you not know? just me. It's not just me saying it. Kirsten, your boss is saying it. Jim is saying it because he's got restraining orders against you. The judge is saying it. The crisis team is saying it. The doctor in the ER. Everybody's telling you you've got a delusion about Jim. You're mentally ill. So here's the question again. Do you go up to the hospital or do you walk out of the emergency room? It's OK if you want to walk out. That's your choice. What do you do? What do you think you'll do? Part of me wants to fight it. I'm like, okay. I'm going to call my my best friend and what's going on? Maybe they could talk to me. You know so, what your best friend, you know what your best friend says, Bernadette? What? Please get help. I've been so worried about you. And this, this wacky idea you have that you're married to Jim. Wow. That would, to... that would turn yeah. me around. Because okay. I trust my friend. Really? Mm hmm Yeah. So as you think back on the last 20, 22 years, do you think your friend, that one comment would convince you you never got married to Jim, you haven't shared your life together for these two decades? One comment. I don't quite understand the question. Could you be convinced you're not married to Jim? Because of her comment? Mm -hmm. No, I would go because she said she's worried about me. Uh -uh. And then I might say to myself, well, maybe there is a problem. So you'd go get some treatment? I would go start with questions. Okay. So here's what happens. We're going we're gonna to wrap this up, okay? Every time you text Jim or call Jim or try to see him, you get back into this cycle. You're you're arrested. You're brought before a judge. The judge offers you treatment or, or trial. And this goes on for a year. You cannot contact Jim without this happening for a year. Do you think after a year you'd finally come to your senses that you were never married to Jim? You'd be convinced? I don't know. If I really? went into treatment to find out about why I think that way, and everyone is convincing me that I'm not married to him, but for a year I've been told this, I guess I would maybe think about it at least or say okay. I'm tired of this. Why bother? Let me, let me ask you this. Do you remember your first date with Jen? Yeah. You remember your wedding day? Yeah. Think of those memories. Are you really saying you could be convinced that never happened? In my mind, they happened. That's right. That's what it's like to have anosognosia for mental illness. No matter what kind of experiences the person has, no matter who's telling them that their reality is false, they know their reality. You know you're married to Jim. Jim. You've been together for 22 years. So those experiences aren't going to educate you. That's what it is. That's what it's like to have anosognosia. So I have one more question. Can I ask you one more question? Mm -hmm. What did it feel like as you imagined this happening to you? Any feelings? Overwhelmed. Overwhelmed? They even think of that possibility of not being able to walk into my house 
to not have the life I thought I had. Right. Yeah. How about scared or angry or both? Both. And also now I don't have a job. That's right. Unemployed. To live if that yep. was the case. And wow. if this went on for if this went on for five years, Bernadette, would you start to feel pretty depressed and isolated, do you think? Because oh, everyone's telling you. Yeah. Okay. Bernadette, two things. Thank you very much for volunteering. My pleasure. And when you get home, go give Jim a big hug. <laughs> I will. <laughs> this was a role play, everybody. Bernadette is married to Jim. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for volunteering and helping oh, us out. Oh, and thank you for all you do. We teach you a lot. In our, I'm in the IFAS program in Cape May uh -huh. County, and we brought your book in, and you know we presented it to our families, and we have quite a few that have followed it, and they've had good results from it. So I'm we want to thank you, too, for what you've helped and we presented. So... Anytime you want to come in and talk to our families, you're always okay. welcome. <laughs> I'm gonna move I'm gonna move on, but thank okay. you so much for thank you for the kind words. I'm glad my work's been helpful. Thank you so much. Katie, can I move on? Or I see Terry has her hand up. Terry Brister. Sorry, I was trying to applaud Bernadette. Excuse me. Oh <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. I'm glad it's helpful. I really am. So listen, when we're helping someone with anosognosia, let's say we're trying to help Bernadette if she really was delusional. You know, the parent knows is the expert and has good information or the sibling or the doctor. It doesn't work because we're not collaborating. I mean, Bernadette, I'm sure, is, wasn't grateful for my diagnosis that her marriage was a delusion or receptive or adherent. I mean, she was trying to escape treatment, right? Uh, what we can't expect, look at the feelings that are up there. Some of them, she, she talked about being overwhelmed, scared, angry, depressed. We can expect those feelings, frustration, anger, hostility, fear, loneliness, depression, and isolation, and noncompliance with treatment, non-adherence, refusing treatment. Because why would you take pills for an illness you were sure you didn't have? So I'm going to just end with giving you just a quick overview of the LEAP approach. Um, this is in the book that Bernadette uh, uh, answered. There are free chapters. If you don't want to buy the book, I'm okay with that. There are free chapters on the NAMI website. I think we have five chapters that I, I donated up there. Um, th this program was selected by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, for their family toolkit. And it's focused on developing relationships that lead to treatment, there are seven tools listed on the left side of, of your screen. I'm going to summarize them for you. We listen by reflecting back without judgment. Remember what I talked about earlier, the research? Non-judgmental, respectful relationship. We empathize, especially for feelings coming from, if the person's delusional, their delusions. Uh, the anisognosia, the anger, the frustration, the sadness that nobody believes me, those are feelings that come from anisognosia. We empathize with those feelings in particular and, and, and the desires of the person. We focus on areas where we can agree. We are not going to agree the person has an illness. If they have anisognosia, that's not possible. So you got to forget that goal and do something real different. Stop educating, start listening Look for areas where you agree so you can partner. That's what you move forward on to achieve common goals that you both agree can be worked on. We delay giving hurtful. This is not an elite acronym. There's there's three more letters, DOA. And it sounds unfortunate, but but we believe that our relationships are dead on arrival if we're not communicating in this respectful way. So we delay giving hurtful and contrary opinions. So if Bernadette asks me, let's say I'm working with her, I'm a probation officer two years down the road. Hey, do you think I'm married to Jim? I might try to delay answering that. Hey, I could be wrong and I'm sorry. I, I, I think this. Um, I hope we don't have to argue about it. I, I don't see that you are married to Jim. There's three A's. Uh, I'm sorry. That's giving our opinion. I jumped ahead. <laughs> uh it could be, you know, it could be wrong, and I'm sorry, but I don't think you're married. There's a way of giving our opinion in the leap approach. It's very humble. Uh, to delay giving our opinion, we say things like, "I promise I'm going to answer your question before I do." 
can you tell me more about and we get the person talking some more and we ask permission can i tell you later so that's delaying and giving our opinion and then we we apologize for acts and interactions that felt disrespectful frustrating or disappointing this is just like learning a new language practice makes perfect role play with with your loved ones or, or colleagues at work uh and i'm going to share some videos with you in just a moment how, how you can access them so you can practice with the videos um, so this is, I'm going to end on just general guidelines. Those are tools, those L-E-A-P, D-O-A. Those are tools. These are steps. First, we absorb what we've heard. And that usually involves active, reflective listening. So again, if I was talking with Bernadette, I'd say, so Bernadette, what you're telling me is you're, you're married to Jim, but nobody believes you anymore. Is that right? Did I get that right? That's active, reflective listening. Then I want to emotionally connect by empathizing or apologizing. Like, I'm sorry, but that's happening to you. Um, it sounds like it's very, I'm, I'm gonna read some of the some of the feelings Bernadette described, that it sounds like it feels very overwhelming and you're frightened and, and depressed and angry about this. Did I get that right? So we wanna connect with their experience and absorb it. Then you can start to problem solve. Then you find areas of agreement and partnering like I did with my brother. He wanted pocket money. I said, I'd give it to him. Uh, in exchange for his agreeing to see a therapist and, and eventually receiving these long-acting injectable medications. There's a lot more detail there, but uh, we don't have the time right now to get into it. We use each of these tools as you need them. You know, think of a tool belt and you've got those seven communication tools in there. So that's an overview. There's a, there's a lot more. Thank you, Bernadette. Thank you, everybody, for your attention and involvement. Before I sign off, if you've got a phone and you want to go to our website, uh, just you know, put your camera up on that code to the right. And that lead, leads you right to leapinstitute.org. When you're at leapinstitute.org, there's a, a tab called Resources Free Videos. You're going to find all kinds of videos that are role plays, that are talks that I've given, uh, there's a TED Talk if you want to educate family or clinicians or colleagues about anisognosia. I, we get a lot of good feedback about that. So thanks again. Sorry I ran a little long, but I will turn it back over to Dr. Duckworth. Duckworth. Uh, Dr. Amador, brilliant talk. Fantastic. So with 3,700 people on a call, you can imagine we have a lot of questions. Um, about 50 questions on medications. Uh, I might take one or two of them later on to give you a break. We okay. have a conversation on managing antipsychotic side effects, long-acting injectables. That'll be coming. Uh, side okay. effects and pregnancy of medications. We have an expert covering that on March the 7th. So let's focus on your area of brilliance, which is kind of forming relationships. So a couple of questions fall into the category of my loved one is non-communicative or we've had a rupture in our relationship. How right. might you proceed in those ways? So there's two things. This comes up a lot. Um, and I call it closing, uh, opening closed doors, right? First, try to see if you can figure out what it was that, that caused the disengagement, the rupture. And usually, in my experience, it's conversations about telling the person that they need medicine or an involuntary hospitalization. So the first step is to apologize, kind of like I did with my brother. I'm sorry for all the times I told you you were mentally ill. I won't ever do it again. Um, apologize for an involuntary hospitalization if that's what that's what's happened. And then really importantly, start listening actively. Ask the person what they're upset about, what they're angry about. Why aren't they talking to you? Now, sometimes they're not talking to, to us because they have a delusion about us. Don't be afraid to reflect that back. So I'm working with a family right now where their their son is convinced that they've been they've been poisoning. The parents have been poisoning him. And uh, I'm practicing with them just reflecting that back. You know, son, what you're saying is we've been trying to, to hurt you, even kill you. Did we get that right? That starts, I know that sounds counterintuitive, but that starts a conversation with the person where you can use those other tools to emotionally connect with them. Um, and if the person's not communicative, I can't believe I'm going to say this uh, because my teenagers drive me nuts with all the texting, but texting is actually really effective. If the person will accept your texts, you can start with an apology for the thing you think they're angry with you about and then do active listening in the text messaging. Thank you. 
Another set of questions gets into the idea, because I'm being accused of doing horrible things, how do I get into the place of being empathic and working towards agreement? Most people don't like those responses. Yeah. And I can recall this in my own family experience. You have a natural limbic response to being yeah. accused of horrible things. Yeah. How do you transcend that normal human response? It's a really, really great question. The number one first thing we have to do is separate the illness from the person. Mm. So remember what your loved one was like before the illness and how they never would have accused you of the horrific things they're accusing you of now. And realize it's not your loved one who's making the accusation. It's chemical chaos in their brain. It's the illness talking to you. So that's the number one thing. Don't take it personally. Don't don't get confused. This is the illness talking to you. And then the other thing is, and, and again, we don't have time, Ken, to get into it in detail, but I'll just say in broad strokes, you want to absorb what they're saying, those three steps I shared. So, so what you're saying, son, is, you know, we sexually abused you when you were an infant. I can see why you're angry with us. And that, and that sounds scary because you're going to make things worse, right? Well, if somebody has a delusion, it's a fixed false belief. You're not going to make the delusion worse, right? So, you know, creating that bridge and, and the research indicates that uh, fundamental pillars of that bridge is respecting the person's reality, their experience, not telling them they're wrong. Now, you do give your opinion with the lead approach. If they push and they want to say, for example, want, want you to admit, admit that you did it, admit that you really did abuse me, um, you can answer that question uh, in the way that we teach it. Those three A's, apologize, acknowledge your fallibility, ask the person not to argue, agree to disagree. So you could say something like, you know, I'm really sorry. I, you know, I appreciate your opening up to me about, about the abuse. Um, I could be wrong. I don't think I'm wrong, son. I don't remember ever doing anything like this. I hope we don't have to argue about it. And that's it. You, you're still stating your, your truth, right? That you didn't do anything wrong, but you're not saying it in a, in a, you know, a sparse way. I didn't do that. I would never do that to you. That's not going to get you anywhere. If you can say, hey, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't see that I did this. And I don't want to argue with you about it. That's more respectful. But I have heard you. But I have heard you. Right. I heard what you've said. I'm not denying what you that you experienced this. Yes. And what's really didn't... important, and what's really important, Ken, with the leap approach is you ask the person, do you feel like I understand you? Because mm -hmm. if the person says, I don't think you do, then you start over. <laughs> But yeah, that is the critical piece is that that your loved one feels heard and that mm. the reality isn't being dismissed mm. you know, out of hand. Uh, but you don't agree. The leap approach is 100% honest. You never pretend you did something that you didn't do. Mm. That's real great. important. Okay, great. Another question uh, gets into this question of supporting versus the question of enabling. Okay. Right? So you're not reality testing the person. You're not saying... That isn't true. The FBI is not at the door. Right. And then if you don't do that, the question of, am I enabling? Am I facilitating a belief? Um, when is support? One is, you know, empathic and what is enabling? And I know these are hard questions, but yeah. you're the master of this entire field. So I'm <laughs> going to give you the hard ones. Emphatically, no, you are not enabling. You are not enabling. When somebody has a psychotic disorder, they're, they have false perceptions, He's seeing things, hearing things, sometimes even feeling things that aren't there. You're not going to make that worse in, in, in the ways that you communicate with the person. Same thing with a delusion. A delusion is a fixed, fixed in concrete false belief. You're not going to make it worse by helping the person to feel heard and understood. And, and, and that builds trust that these illnesses and our inability to communicate effectively erodes. So, you know, we run, we want to rebuild that trust. And the number one way to do that is to respect and empathize with your loved one's experience. Mm. You're not going to make their psychotic symptoms worse. It's not possible. So again, you go back to the quality of the relationship. That's your North star. Yes. Thank yes. you. All right. 
Next level of complexity. My family members interacted with the treatment system and they want to have me be the guardian, involuntary hospitalize him, inject medicines into him in the hospital against his will. You know, variations on this theme of a non-leap engagement. Right. Or even the psychiatrist saying, Bob, you've got to take your meds. Right. Right. Like um, in the clinical room. And then, you know, the person comes home and they're not having that leap experience integrated into the hair. No. How do you approach that problem? With a lot of empathy and even apology. Like, I'm, mm. I'm sorry that this is the situation we're in and that I have this responsibility now. Uh, uh, you know, it's a third of, of the I'm Not Sick, I Don't Need Help book is all about involuntary treatments. <laughs> uh, I mean, most of it is about anesthesia and LEAP, but sometimes we're that's not enough. And, and we are in a situation where we we are in a uh, court mandated treatment, for example. So you do it with a lot of empathy. You know, if, if I was in your place, son, I I'd be really angry about this too. And I know I testified at the hearing, and I hope you can forgive me. May, and if you're comfortable with it, a statement of fallibility. Maybe I was wrong to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, I just was following my heart, and I thought it was the right thing. Mm -hmm. I respect your truth. You're telling me, and this is active reflective listening, you're telling me, son, that you're not mentally ill and this court order is a traumatic travesty of justice, right? Right. I can see why you're angry. There's reflective listening and empathy. Well, then why are you doing it, dad? I just thought it was the right thing to do. And I'm sorry, I don't want to argue with you. So that's the nature of the dialogue. You want to apologize. You want to be empathic. You want to mm. actively listen. For those of you interested, I'm going to give you a break. You could just take a deep breath. Dr. Amador, you've done a tremendous uh, presentation. I'm going to try to address a few of the other questions. Uh, questions about research, brain scans, genetics. Uh, we had Jordan Smoller, who's running a million person, all of us genetic biology uh, in um, research program. That is on Ask the Expert. That's our website. Uh, Katie Harris, who's our star facilitator, and producer will give you both these slides, but also all the previous presentations where we try to attract the best thinkers in the field, uh, the entire field. Um, so those questions uh, have been answered by people who are actively working on it. Long acting injectables have the same side effects as oral medications. They are in fact the same medicines. They just stick around in your fat. So I just wanted to mention that, and there is no brain scan that you can test for anosognosia, and there is no way to identify uh, that a brain change has occurred. Dr. Amador, do you disagree with anything that I mentioned right there? 100% agree. I will say one thing. People, I get asked the question all the time, uh, how do you know it's anosognosia? It's actually very intuitive. If, if the person you're trying to help, your loved one, has had ample opportunity to learn they have a mental health condition and it's gone on for a month, several months, a year or longer, and they have not learned, they have not developed insight or awareness, you're dealing with anosognosia. Mm. You don't need a brain scan. It's, it's, it's common sense, you know, intuitive. There's a question about kind of the episodic versus permanent nature of anosognosia. And I happen to see in my own childhood, my dad would become psychotic with a manic episode, then not have anosognosia, but he then had denial about the illness process. Yeah. So yeah. He, he lived with both of these things. I just want a normal dad. So I lived with denial. Yeah. He would get out of the hospital. We go to the Tigers game. I was happy. Right. Yeah. Like I didn't take it up with him for many reasons, but mostly um, you know, I just didn't want to take it on because I had this intuition that it wasn't going to work. What right. about permanence versus the course of delusions? Do they improve with medications for some people? How do you think about kind of the process of anosognosia? I know it's individual, but I'm yeah. interested in your answer to this because it's come up in multiple questions. Well, I can tell, I mean, I can answer it clinically, my clinical experience with now thousands of people with these illnesses, but let me start with the research. What's the evidence base? What the research shows is that with schizophrenia, 
it tends to stay stable in most patients. But that that's most patients, that the majority of patients, like my brother, he never developed awareness. Um, but there's you know a smaller proportion, about 10 to 15 percent, who with treatment, the anisognosia improves along with the other psychotic symptoms. But the majority don't. Now, bipolar disorder, like your dad had, is different. Uh, anisognosia is exacerbated, all right? It's exacerbated during the manic phase, during the, the euthymic phase, when, in other words, stabilization phase, or when the person has depression, it tends, the anisognosia tends to remit a bit, and, and the person has the ability to understand. That doesn't mean denial can't kick in. That's another whole layer. Right. But anisognosia in itself, let me summarize succinctly, with schizophrenia, tends to not improve the treatment. With bipolar disorder, it tends to improve the treatment. But you got to keep your eye on the ball because it it, it can still exist at a, at a mild level. Mm. And uh, be encouraging the person silently, well, I'm feeling better. I can go off the meds now. So you want to keep an open dialogue about the person's understanding of whether they have an illness or not. Well, you know, this has just been a fantastic presentation. Everyone who registered will get this presentation they can watch. You will get the slides. Dr. Amador has made himself available. You can connect with him through the Leaf Institute or the Henry Amador Center. Um, I just want to thank Bernadette for volunteering. Yes. Thank you. Fantastic job, Bernadette. Uh, rather stressful what the good doctor put you through, but mostly I, I want to thank you for this presentation and for helping deal with one of the hardest pieces of the entire field in psychiatry. I mean, this is one of the hardest corners, and I just want to applaud you for continuing to study and work the problem. Uh, thank I you. think it's really been valuable. So uh, let's go to the next couple of slides. Uh, we have a couple more all-stars coming. Uh, Marlene Freeman is the director of maternal women's mental health at Mass General Hospital. She is a superstar. And we'll be talking with her about planning for pregnancy when you have a mental health condition, dealing with the risks and benefits of medications when you have a mental health condition, how to think about it before you get pregnant, if you find out you're pregnant, if you're in the postpartum. Uh, so uh, Dr. Freeman is a, a superstar and has led really a lot of the research in this field. Uh, supported employment. This is a way of helping people get a job that Bob Drake and his spouse invented. Uh, we'll be doing this with Peggy Swarbrick uh, of New Jersey. And... Um, Look ahead, we're going to be doing things on long-acting injectables, side-effective antipsychotics. Um, we try to take up the most important things in our topics. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Nami's first book, uh, this is just shameless promotion. I was very fortunate to have Dr. Amador write a brilliant essay on how do you get a person to accept help uh, as part of this book. And while I talk to experts across the nation, I also interviewed 130 people, family members, and individuals who live with mental health conditions and had them share what they had learned. I was very impressed <laughs> as I traveled in the field of psychiatry that no one had really asked regular people what they had learned because you, in fact, are also an expert in your own experience. All the royalties go to NAMI. It's a love gift. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. You are not alone, but this is not medical advice. And of course, uh, you have to integrate this into your own experience. We like donations. There's a little link to donate. Uh, we have a fabulous team, Katie Harris, Zahira Correa, Alex Dorgan. These teams, you know, that provide this support enable us to run these webinars. So thanks to them and thanks to you for donating. Um, next slide, please. Thanks for joining. If you want to reach out to me, I'm Ken at NAMI.org. It's like a vanity license plate. There's nobody named Ken at NAMI. You can't explain it. And uh, even with the success of the Barbie movie, nobody named Ken has uh, appeared. If you have a question for Ask the Expert on logistics, how to get this recording or the slides, they're all going to be sent to you if you're registered. But uh, feel free to reach out to me 
if I can be of help to you. Uh, being NAMI's chief medical officer is my dream job, and I consider it a great honor. So again, uh, thank you, Dr. Amador, for this brilliant and comprehensive presentation. Thank you all for attending, and uh, I hope you all have a great evening, and feel free to join us for these future sessions. Take care now.